conflict series covering recent major wars and crises, including this video's next part. Haiti, a country of nearly 12 million people in the Caribbean, is on the brink of total state collapse. Around 200 different heavily armed gangs have managed to seize control over large swaths of the country's territory, and are operating with near impunity. While some of the more heavily armed gangs that are more similar to paramilitaries have managed to seize control over as much as 90% of Haiti's capital and largest city, Port-au-Prince. These gangs have been able to completely overpower what little is left in the country of the former Haitian government. Some of the larger and more heavily armed ones have even managed to establish roadblocks and checkpoints between Port-au-Prince and the country's largest airport, and between Port-au-Prince and the country's primary maritime ports and oil terminals. By doing so, they have, in effect, become capable of holding the entire country as a hostage, by dominating Haiti's access to the outside world and access to imports of crucial supplies and oil. There's hardly even a Haitian government left in the country to speak of that's actually capable of fighting back against them, because there aren't even any elected government officials remaining in the country at all now. The most recently elected president of Haiti, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated two and a half years ago now back in July of 2021 by still unidentified gunmen who raided his own private residence. President of Haiti, Jovenel Moise. In fact, no elections of any kind have been held in Haiti since 2016, nearly eight years ago now. As before Moise was assassinated, he chose to continually delay the Haitian elections that were supposed to take place in 2019. His choice to delay those elections, along with corruption allegations and a worsening economy in the island nation, led to mass protests against him that ultimately culminated in his assassination in July of 2021, under deeply suspicious circumstances. The gunmen who murdered him are assumed to continue remaining at large, while Haiti's own governmental investigation into the matter has been extremely slow going, a fact that appears very suspicious when you can Consider that nearly two days before Moise was assassinated, Moise had appointed a man named Ariel Henry to become the country's next prime minister. Then, two days later, Moise was killed in his home, and Ariel Henry rose to power as Haiti's new acting prime minister, without ever being ratified by the country's senate. After taking over, Henry has also continually delayed elections in the country for the past two and a half years. Meaning that since no new president has ever been elected, and every single member in the Senate's wake struck Haiti's Tiburon Peninsula in August of 2021, that would rock Haiti even further. That disaster would kill around 2,250 people in the country, and injure more than 12,000. and others, and would also cause up to $1.7 billion in economic destruction for Haiti, representing about 8% of the entire Haitian nominal GDP at the time. So if you're following, in the span of just two months across the summer of 2021, Haiti witnessed violence of all kinds within Haiti has therefore skyrocketed ever since 2021, largely as a result of the gang war that has been raging across the country's capital city, with the United Nations reporting that more than 3,000 people in Haiti have been killed by gang violence in 2023 alone. A statistic that makes the current conflict going on in Haiti one of the most violent ongoing conflicts in the entire world right now, with a comparable number of deaths from warfare in 2023 as happened in Yemen. As a result, in July of 2023, the Biden administration in the United States urged all American citizens to immediately leave from Haiti and to not travel to the country under any circumstances until further notice, as Haiti continues to collapse into increasingly violent anarchy. Moreover, since the current crisis in Haiti exploded in mid-2021, well over 100,000 Haitians have fled from their country as refugees and risked their lives either by traveling to South America and then trekking by foot through the notoriously dangerous Darien Gap northwards to the United States, or have embarked towards U.S. territory directly by whatever makeshift boats or water-capable crafts they've been able to get their hands on, which has recently made Haitians one of the largest nationalities of people being encountered by the United States Border Patrol ever since. Due to the fact that the various gangs in Haiti currently control an estimated 90% of the capital and largest city in the country, and the government has completely lost its monopoly on force, the unelected Ariel Henry administration has been repeatedly requesting and at times pleading for a foreign armed intervention into the country to crush the power of the gangs and to restore the power and authority of the government across the whole country. After which, Henry has promised to finally host the terminally delayed elections in Haiti again. On the 2nd of October 2023, his frequent requests for this foreign intervention were finally granted, after the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution authorizing yet another armed intervention into Haiti. As the details currently stand now as of December 2023, the United States will be largely funding the intervention with more than $100 million, while the East African nation of Kenya will be taking the lead of the intervention with boots on the ground. 
they will be deploying at least a thousand of their own police officers and soldiers to Haiti, with the objective of destroying the gang's control over the capital and restoring the authority of the Haitian government. And they'll be assisted by smaller numbers of troops deployed from the neighboring Caribbean countries of Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Antigua and Barbuda. But this latest intervention into Haiti going on right now is only the most recent one in a very, very long history of foreign interventions into the country that have gone back centuries. None of which have ever succeeded in establishing the conditions to prevent another intervention from becoming necessary again in the future. Out of the past 108 years of history, going back to 1915, Haiti has seen the presence of foreign troops deployed to its soil for 41 of those years, or about 38% of the time, including very recently in 1994, and then again between 2004 and 2019, and soon to be yet again in 2023 and likely 2024 until who knows when always in the name of securing the peace in the country and achieving political stability, and yet never actually succeeding in doing so. The current crisis going on in Haiti is, however, arguably the worst in the country's entire modern history, as Haiti currently stands on the precipice of becoming the only truly failed state in the Western Hemisphere, on a par with the likes of Myanmar, Sudan, or Afghanistan, as measured by 2023's edition of the Fragile States Index. And as Haiti collapses further into anarchy and violence, and the United Nations intervention led by Ken and funded by the United States comes to try and restore order to the country again, Haiti's only geographic neighbor by land right next door, the Dominican Republic, or DR, is building a new Great Wall along their entire length of shared border to separate themselves from the Haitians even more than they already are. The Dominicans began the wall's construction in February of 2023, as the gang war in Haiti was escalating, and when it's finished, it will be the second longest wall anywhere in the Americas, remaining only behind the length of the U.S.-Mexico border wall. It'll be 4 meters high and made up of 20 centimeter thick concrete, and topped with metal mesh to prevent people from climbing over it. More than 70 watchtowers are planned to be constructed along the wall, while dozens of gates will be built into it to enable Dominican soldiers to carry out patrols. The wall will include drones, cameras, radars, motion sensors, and fiber optic cables for communications that are all designed to block anyone the Dominicans don't want from the Haitian side from being able to cross over the border. And once it's completed, the wall will effectively transform Haiti and the Dominican Republic into two completely separate islands, despite them each sharing the same geographic island. And despite the fact that they've shared this same island for centuries, the Dominican Republic and Haiti ended up experiencing radically different destinies, and even without the wall, the two may as well already be in completely different worlds. In nominal terms, the Dominican Republic's economy is four and a half times larger than Haiti's, while in purchasing power parity terms, the Dominican Republic's economy is seven times larger than Haiti's, despite the two countries having a roughly comparable population. This further means that when it comes to GDP per capita, Dominicans are on average five to eight times wealthier than Haitians are next door, with citizens of the Dominican Republic being more comparable to countries like Serbia or Argentina, and citizens of Haiti being more comparable to countries like Rwanda and Uganda. In terms of poverty, about 58% of Haitians live on less than $3.65 a day, making Haiti one of only six countries worldwide outside of Sub-Saharan Africa where the majority of the population continues to live under poverty. By comparison, only 4.3% of the Dominican Republic's population still lives in poverty, while Dominicans also live around a decade longer than Haitians do. 98% of the Dominican Republic's population have access to electricity, while only 47% of Haitians do, which, once again, makes Haiti one of only two countries anywhere in the world outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, where the majority of the population still doesn't have any access to electricity. Haiti is on the brink of becoming a failed state, with runaway violence and is one of the most hopelessly impoverished countries in the world, while the Dominican Republic right next door is on the cusp of transitioning into a high-income, fully developed country by the end of the decade in 2030. If Haiti remains more or less in the same state as it is now by then, there will probably be no other greater disparity in the entire world across borders by levels of development and income other than the Saudi and Oman borders with Yemen and the South Korea-Russia-China borders with North Korea. So how did this very unique situation on this island develop in the first place? Why did Haiti and the Dominican Republic, despite existing together on the same island for centuries and having a very comparable current population size, end up so vastly different from one another and so separate from each other? 
Some of the factors that explain this difference today are historical reasons, but they don't explain the whole picture. You see, the island that they both exist on, Hispaniola, was initially colonized by the Spanish, but it was first legally divided in 1697 by the Treaty of Ricewick that formally established a Spanish colony in the eastern two-thirds of the island, and a French colony in the western third, though the borders between them were slightly different than they are today. From the very beginning of this division of the island, though, the French and the Spanish treated their separate colonies on either side radically differently. The Spanish ended up pursuing a policy that was more focused on settler colonialism over on their side, with more limited amounts of slavery by the standards of the time. By the end of the 18th century, the modern Dominican Republic, still under Spanish colonial rule, only had a population of about 104,000 people, only 30,000 of whom were enslaved people from Africa. And meanwhile, the French over on their side of the island treated things extremely different. They pursued a policy of historically enormous exploitation, the likes of which have hardly ever been seen before or since. It's estimated that across the 18th century alone, the French forcibly transported approximately 800,000 Africans from their continent to modern-day Haiti as slaves, a figure that represents nearly double the number of African slaves brought to the entire North American continent during the entirety of the North Atlantic slave trade. By 1789, on the eve of the French Revolution, it's estimated that Haiti's population was around 556,000 people, which was a little more than five times the total population of the neighboring Spanish colonial Dominican Republic. But only 32,000 of the people who lived in Haiti at that time were European whites. There were an additional 24,000 freed people of color and an estimated 500,000 Africans and their descendants bound in the chains of slavery, outnumbering their white colonial masters by a ratio of nearly 16 to 1. France used all of these slaves as their labor source to work across the vast sugar and coffee plantations that they set up all across the island which for a time made Haiti the most lucrative and financially valuable colony in the entire world, for the people who actually dominated it so ruthlessly. By 1789, roughly half of all the sugar and coffee that was being consumed in Europe came from the slave debt forced upon Haitian society, and concluded that had all of that money stayed within Haiti from the very beginning, and was used for their own development and compounded over the past two centuries of history since then, it would have been worth a minimum of approximately $21 billion in today's money, and potentially as much as $115 billion by other estimates. After the Dominican Republic gained their own independence, they would never face this same kind of debt problem that was forced upon them by their former colonial overlords that lasted well into the mid-20th century, and so they would have greater opportunities to invest resources into themselves from earlier on. But that's still only a part of the full explanation into how they became so heirs from France. But immediately afterwards, Haiti decided to invade and conquer the Dominican Republic just the following year in 1822, three years before the double debt was forced upon them by France. After the double debt was forced on them, the Haitians attempted to then force the Dominicans they had conquered to help pay it off, by levying very high taxes on them. The Haitians would end up occupying the Dominican Republic for a total of 22 years as they attempted to incorporate the entire island under the rule of Haiti, an occupation that is remembered within the Dominican Republic today as a particularly refused to recognize their independence and would launch four more military invasions into the Dominican Republic until they were finally decisively defeated for good in 1856. It wouldn't be all the way until 1867 that Haiti would finally recognize the Dominican Republic's independence and abandon their ambition to dominate the entire island. From there, the two sides of the same island experienced fairly similar histories for a very long time. Although the Dominican Republic didn't have the same exact kind of debt issues that Haiti had, both were impoverished and politically unstable countries invaded and occupied by American troops the following year in 1916. For seven years, the United States occupied the entirety of Hispaniola and meddled around with the border further to create the modern boundary between Haiti and the Dominican Republic that we know today. The United States withdrew from the Dominican Republic in 1924, but continued occupying Haiti for the next decade until 1934, representing a 19-year-long occupation of Haiti by the United States, and representing one of the longest foreign occupations in all of American history. All as Citibank was able to expand its economic control over the country and impose new predatory loans on the Haitian government in the process. Then, after the United States withdrew from both countries, the Dominican Republic and Haiti alike experienced long periods of authoritarian dictatorial rule that saw little economic Americans left the country, while Haiti eventually coalesced under the control of another dictator named Francois Duvalier in 1957. 
Trujillo's police state in the Dominican Republic lasted for 31 years until he was assassinated in 1961, leading to another period of chaos in the Dominican Republic that culminated with a civil war in the country blowing up in 1965. Then, fearful of the communist regime in Cuba's ability to influence the civil war and flip the Dominican Republic into another Caribbean communist state, the United States intervened directly in the Dominican Civil War and found itself occupying the Dominican Republic again. But, after that, the United States was able to organize elections in the country in 1966 and withdrew the same year. And there has never been another foreign intervention coup d'etat. During these 29 years that the Duvalier regime survived in Haiti, it was consistently supported and propped up by the United States because of the Duvalier's harsh anti-communist policies that Washington saw as vital to counterbalancing communist Cuba in the Caribbean only 50 miles away from Haiti. Communist activities within Haiti were punishable by the death penalty under the Duvaliers, and as many as 60,000 Haitians were killed by their secret police. So, ultimately, while the Dominican Republic emerged from their authoritarian dictatorship and civil war period in 1966, Haiti wouldn't end up emerging from their dictatorship period until 20 years later in 1986, and they've never been able to emerge from their chaotic period afterwards. Up to the point of 1966, when the Dominican Republic successfully held elections and the United States withdrew from the country, the Dominican Republic and Haiti were basically two sides of the same coin. Both were highly impoverished and underdeveloped with very similarly sized economies, very similar incomes, very similar population sizes, and both had been isolated from the outside world for decades because of long-standing authoritarian dictatorships and or continuous political instability that had long scared away foreign investment. But then, things started changing for the Dominican Republic in the late 1960s and early 1970s, as the country began successfully reforming itself, becoming more democratic, more stable, and steadily opening up more to trade with the outside world. It's at this moment that when you compare the graphs of inflation-adjusted GDP per capita between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, that you begin to see the Dominican Republic finally start rapidly accelerating away from Haiti. And the strange part about this graph is that the absolute all-time high of Haiti's GDP per capita to date was actually back during the repressive Duvalier dictatorship period all the way back in 1980. Ever since then, for more than 40 years now, Haiti's GDP per capita has either decreased continually or remained largely stagnant, while the Dominican Republic's has continually exploded upwards. So, clearly, while deep historical factors new American military intervention into the country in 1994 to topple the military junta from power and restore Aristide back to the presidency, the United States sent two aircraft carriers to Haiti and more than 20,000 troops during Operation Uphold Democracy in 1994. And then, faced with this overwhelming firepower, the Haitian military junta collapsed and conceded power to avoid a war they knew they would lose. Aristide was then reinstated as the country's president, and then he would win re-election again for another term in 2001. But then, then 21 billion dollars in reparations. A figure that was at the time more than four times greater than the entire Haitian GDP. Within only months of him making this demand, far-right paramilitary rebels in Haiti began launching an extremely successful rebellion in the country, and some of these rebels had allegedly received previous training from U.S. Special Forces. By February of 2004, these rebels had captured Haiti's fourth and second largest cities, and they were beginning to lay siege to the capital, Port-au-Prince. As the route any knowledge of where he was actually going, where the French managed to convince the Central African Republic to accept him live on the plane as the events were continuing to happen, where he was then forcibly flown into exile against his will. These allegations from Aristide have also been pretty heavily supported by the actions of the Americans and the French that surrounded the timeline of his removal from power. Very notably, the United Nations Security wouldn't you know it, Alexander also immediately withdrew Haiti's demand for the $21 billion worth of reparations from France that Aristide had made himself only months previously. And no official Haitian government demands on the reparations have been made ever since. The very next day, a thousand U.S. Marines were suddenly deployed to Haiti to restore order, while French, Canadian, and Chilean troops came the following morning. 18 years later in 2022, a damning report released by the New York Times including direct testimony from the former French ambassador who was serving to Haiti, despite being located on the same island, 
Haiti and the Dominican Republic do have some very notably different geographic quirks about them. While some people have speculated in the past that the rainfall levels are higher in the Dominican Republic and that contributes to better agricultural potential, that's not actually really true. Rainfall levels across both sides of the island are fairly consistent, and if anything, the Haitian side actually receives a little more rainfall than the Dominican side does. With abundant rainfall, warm temperatures year-round, and fairly good soils, both sides of the island naturally possess a very strong capability for agriculture. Culture. Haiti's population was roughly 4 million, while the Dominican Republic's was about 3.4 million. 40 years later, by 2001, the Dominican Republic's population more than doubled to about 8.7 million, while Haiti's would roughly double as well to about 8.5 million. While both would keep on growing from there at similar rates to their current populations in 2023, of about 11.8 million people in Haiti and 11.3 million people in the Dominican Republic. However, despite the two having very similar levels of demographic growth and very similar total population sizes, Haiti is only about half of the Dominican Republic's geographic size, which means that Haiti has always been significantly more densely populated than the Dominican Republic has been. In fact, out of all the countries in the world today with more than 1 million people, Haiti is one of the most densely populated anywhere, with an average density that's roughly identical to the Netherlands. Other than Little Barbados, Haiti is the most densely populated country in the Western Hemisphere today, with a significantly higher density than all of its immediate neighbors. But density all on its own doesn't imply poverty. In fact, higher population densities appear to correlate more with greater wealth generation worldwide, not less. Out of the top 15 densest countries with more than a million people in the world, roughly half of them are are considered to be highly developed economies. Most of them are fairly middle of the road, and only three of them are considered to be least developed countries. And only Haiti among those three is located outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. Within Haiti's unique geographic setting, however, higher population density works against it, in the sense that Haiti is also one of the most uniquely vulnerable locations, being that Hispaniola is placed in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean, which is one of the most hurricane-prone locations in the world. Devastating and powerful hurricanes have rocked both Haiti and Dominican Republic, which makes them more vulnerable to higher levels of damage whenever these storms hit the island. And second, Haiti has a serious deforestation problem that the neighboring with these imported fossil fuels, while the Dominican Republic generates 85% of their electricity with them. And both continue to overwhelmingly rely on imported gasoline for their transportation sectors. But, because the Dominican Republic has been a more politically stable source of foreign investment ever since the 1970s, the Dominican Republic has been able to attract greater foreign investment than Haiti has, and so they have a significantly more developed relation has regular access to electricity as of 2021, while only 47% of Haitians have regular access to electricity. Haiti is therefore one of only two countries worldwide outside of Sub-Saharan Africa where the majority of people still don't have any access to electricity, the only other one being Papua New Guinea and Oceania. And because of this, the majority of Haitians continue relying instead on burning wood for cheap. It's currently estimated that because of these factors, only about 12% of Haiti's land continues to be covered by forest, which is down from about 60% forest cover only a century ago back in 1923. The neighboring Dominican Republic right next door, however, continues to have about 44% of its much larger landmass covered by forests. This huge difference between them becomes extremely evident when you look at the border between them today, which, even without the wall that's currently being constructed between them, is one of the most obvious political border problem. Haiti is more vulnerable to destruction from hurricanes than the Dominican Republic is, despite them each being present on the same exact island. But Haiti also has another extremely serious geographic handicap that is largely absent in the nave Hispaniola exists at the geologic intersection of the North American tectonic plate to the north and the Caribbean tectonic plate to the south. Two major fault lines run across the island in the south and the north. And when you overlay a map of the island's population density and political borders over these fault lines, you begin to see the major problem. Haiti is more than twice as densely populated as the Dominican Republic, and the most densely populated part of the country is located precisely along this southern fault line. The Dominican Republic has a more spread out population, and the Dominican Republic's biggest city, Santo Domingo, is safely located in the southeast of the island far away from both of the fault lines. And across recent history, this northern 
Guard fault line has been the more dormant of the two, with very few notable events over the past several centuries. This has meant that the Dominican Republic's second largest city, Santiago de los Caballeros, has been spared from any very big earthquakes just like the Dominican Republic's largest city has been as well. And then, on the other hand, Haiti has not been as fortunate. It appears that the southern fault line that runs through the island goes through alternating periods of intense seismic activity and long dormant periods in between. It was very active during the French and Spanish colonial periods and caused frequent devastating the nation of Haiti to their core. The epicenter of the quake struck merely 16 miles away from Haiti's capital and largest city, Port-au-Prince. The homes that were poorly built with cement and cinder blocks to resist hurricanes came crashing down, and an estimated 250,000 Haitians lost their lives, making the 2010 Haiti earthquake the single deadliest natural disaster of the entire 21st century so far, and something that the neighboring Dominican Republic was almost completely spared from. And in addition to killing around a hundred and twenty thousand people in Haiti would become infected by cholera, while ten thousand of them would die from the disease. And then, as the cholera outbreak was raging after Moise's assassination and the rise of Henry, the southern fault line running through Haiti triggered again and caused another catastrophic earthquake in Haiti's Tiburon Peninsula that killed more than 2,200 people and caused another 1.7 billion dollars in estimated economic damage. And that is what established the conditions for the gangs in Haiti to begin carving out their control of about 90% of the country's capital. Haiti's current status as a failing state, and the United Nations deciding that yet another armed intervention into the country was necessary just a few months ago. In addition to agreeing on a five-year defense cooperation agreement with Kenya that offered up unspecified U.S. support for Kenya in their own ongoing war with al-Shabaab in neighboring Somalia. So, in exchange for increased American support fighting against al-Shabaab at home, and knowing that Kenyan soldiers can earn much higher wages as a part of UN peacekeeping operations than they otherwise could within the Kenyan armed forces, Kenya has agreed to lead the charge into Haiti and deploy a thousand of their own police officers and soldiers as a part of this newest UN intervention. Their mission will be to reclaim the control of Port-au-Prince from 10 in the present, have caused around $14 billion worth of economic damage to the country, and have continued hobbling Haiti's ability to develop. While the last time that a major natural disaster hit the Dominican Republic was Hurricane George back in 1998 that caused more than $9.3 billion in damage. But there have been very negligible natural disasters that have happened to the Dominican Republic ever since. Ultimately, without the same deforestation problem, without the same high levels of population density, and without the same levels of crippling economic lost opportunities from the colonial era that Haiti has endured, the Dominican Republic has been much more resistant to earthquakes and hurricanes than Haiti has been. And with much less frequent catastrophic natural disasters and greater political stability, the Dominican Republic has been able to accomplish a lot of things recently that Haiti has never Never been able to do, like establishing an absolutely booming tourism sector. In 2022, more than 8.5 million tourists visited the Dominican Republic, making it the most popular tourist destination in the entire Caribbean and even within the top five most popular tourist destinations even further. And while neither side has any major fossil fuel resources, the Dominican Republic has had far more mineral wealth discovered than Haiti has, which includes the location of what's literally the largest and most profitable gold mine in all of Latin America, and the 13th largest gold mine discovered in the entire world, the Pueblo Viejo Mine. This single huge gold mine currently represents about 2% of the Dominican Republic's entire GDP now, and it's become the country's single largest corporate taxpayer, having paid more than $2.6 billion in taxes just between 2013 and 2020. By contrast, Haiti has exactly zero existing mines currently in operation, and there haven't ever been any discoveries made in the country that are as significant as time as the country's security sovereignty is restored. The argument goes that the French government who initially extorted Haiti with the indemnity in 1825, along with the American government and the banks like CIC and Citibank who profited off of the indemnity later, should finally honor the demands made by Jean-Bertrand Aristide in 2003 by setting up a reparations payment to Haiti totaling $21 billion, an amount that is still greater than the entire Haitian GDP. 
Without it, they argue, Haiti will continue not being able to invest in themselves and develop themselves, and they'll continue being a politically unstable and violent open wound on the Earth's surface that continues causing expensive problems for all of their neighbors down the road, like the Dominican Republic's new border wall, in addition to the hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing towards the United States, that Washington will keep having to deal with. If this next intervention into Haiti only 